so you can get more information. Some other changes you might notice is this new desk that's right out here in the lobby. It used to be over there. It was the servant E desk. Now it's here and it's also the info desk. It's a multitasking desk. It does lots of things. And it kind of clears up some space out there in the atrium so people can hang out, sit, drink coffee, and enjoy things. So, but speaking of Servant E, ShareFest is coming up. And if you want to find out more, you can come to this desk, find out more about ShareFest, but it's something we've done the last few years, April 30th and May 1st. And it's time when we can go out to our community and serve people around us. And we'll give you more information as, come, as time goes by, but come check out some information here and uh, get ready for ShareFest. We were all set to show you an update video from Kirk and the team over there in Japan, but as you know, um, the earthquake and tsunami that's happened over there affected the team as well, and we were able to get some uh, raw footage of what's happening. So, take a look. Konnichiwa. Good afternoon from the land of the rising sun, and that's about all the Japanese you're going to get out of me. <laughs> but we're here hanging out at the Tama Christian Center, with pastors Tim and Christine Huber. And they planted this church 20-something uh, years ago. And we love coming here to support them and encourage them because um, you may not know this, but they're missionaries that Canyon View has been supporting for a number of years. This feels so creepy. <laughs> Get away from the yeah. Hey, Kengo, can you hold this? Mm -hmm. Sure. Thank you. Just hold it tight. Oh. That was intense. <laughs> that was annoying. It's still going. It's still going. Aren't we glad God protected our very special Kirk? <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm Glenn Brown, one of the uh, elders here, and it's my privilege to share the word this morning. And I want to congratulate you. You're especially sharp and intelligent. You set your clocks forward and got here on time. <laughs> Or maybe you got here late for the first service, in which case I take it back. <laughs> so um, I'm really sleepy this morning. I got up at 2 o'clock to set my clocks forward, and I couldn't go back to sleep. And uh, I just hope God is not mad at us for messing with time. When, when, when Kirk left for Japan, I, I told him I, I beat him to Japan in 1945. At the end of World War II, uh, I went, went into the Navy, and the war was just over, and I went over to, to Japan to be part of the occupying uh, force that was there for a short time. I have my picture in my cute little sailor suit in front of that big Buddha that he showed uh, uh, several months ago, so just wanted to let you, let you know that. <laughs> Let's pray. <laughs> 
Heavenly Father, bless you. Thank you for keeping Kirk and our, our dear friends uh, safe. We do again pray for the people of Japan that you'd bless them in their trauma and their tragedy. Comfort them, Lord. Bless them. Bless our church, Lord, and bless us this morning as, as we seek to, to uh, let your word become a part of who we are. In Jesus' name, amen. In the fourth chapter of Matthew, uh, there's a report that Jesus had been going all around Galilee, teaching and healing every kind of disease among the people, epileptics, the blind, demonized, paralyzed, every kind of sickness and pain. And great multitudes followed him. We can well understand why. And then in Matthew, the, chapter 5, the, the first verse, when it starts the Sermon on the Mount, it says, And when he, Jesus, saw the multitudes, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he started his sermon. I said he sat down to preach the sermon. And a, a huge crowd spread out before him, every kind of person. Of course, there were many sick people, mostly poor people, fishermen, shepherds. And Jesus starts this, this tremendous, the, the greatest sermon that's ever been preached on earth. And in it, he, he, he propounds, he expresses values that turn all our worldly values upside down. Starting with the Beatitudes that have been covered in the last few weeks. Blessed are the meek and humble, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who are persecuted, and so forth. And then in Matthew 5, 13 through 16 is our, is our reading for today. And, and would, could we read this together, please? You are the salt of the earth. Let, let's, let's start over. Wait, I saw three people not reading. <laughs> let's read this together, please. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Jesus says to this crowd of people, you are the light of the world. They must have been thinking, what in the world does he mean? We're just working people, common people. We're not the holy people, the priests and Pharisees and Sadducees, Jesus, what do you mean by that statement? Over in John 8, 12, Jesus makes this statement. I am the light of, of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, and so forth. And, and we Christians can certainly agree with that. But we know that we don't have any light. But, of course, we have come to understand that when we come to Christ, we do have light, but it's a reflected light, like the sun and the moon, or like the sun and the earth. The earth from space is a beautiful blue planet when it's reflecting the sun, but without the sun, it's dark, and if the sun disappeared, after a while, the earth would be a dead planet. So whatever Jesus meant when he said, you are the light of the world, he did not mean that we're to bring glory to ourselves. And in fact, he says, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Remember from the beginning, the, the disciples kept arguing about who was the greatest. In Mark 9.34, they were on the road with Jesus and they had been disputing, arguing about who would be the greatest. In Luke 9.46, which I think is a different report because it happens in a different time frame, they were again arguing about who was the greatest, and Jesus set a little child in the midst of them and challenged them that they had to be like little children. 
in, in Luke 22, 24, which occurred in the upper room for, for crying out loud. It was just, it was after they had been with Jesus three, three and a half years, however long his earthly minister, ministry took place. And just before the next day, he would be taken to the cross. They're still arguing. There was a dispute among them about who would be the greatest. John and James probably said, we're the greatest. You remember that their mommy had already gone to Jesus and asked if they could sit at his right and left hand in the coming kingdom. Bartholomew probably said, I believe I'm the greatest. Matthew probably said, no man, I'm good. I got the right stuff. I think I'm the greatest. But Peter said, I am definitely the greatest. I'm the one that got that revelation about Jesus being the Son of God. Now, flash forward about two months. After Jesus' trial before Pontius Pilate and Caiaphas, when Peter denied Jesus three times, after the cross and the resurrection, after the time on the beach when, when Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me, seeking to heal his heart and offset the times he had denied Jesus by allowing him to affirm that, yes, he did love Jesus. After the day of Pentecost, when Peter received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, a drastic change had happened in Peter's heart. In Acts 3, when Peter and John were going to the temple, you, you remember that story, there was a lame man there, been lame from, from birth, and they, Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give you, rise and walk. And the man rose up, and his, his legs and ankles were strengthened, and he stood up walking and leaping and praising God. And the story goes on to say, all the people ran up, they saw the lame man walking, they started looking at Peter and John as if they were gods. And I love this in, in uh, Acts 3.12. So Peter, when he saw these people with the adulation in their eyes toward him and John, he responded to the people. Men of Israel, why, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us? as though by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk. He's disclaiming the praise that they were trying to give him. And he says in verse 16, It's in his name, Jesus' name, through faith in his name, that has made this man strong whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Isn't that great? What an amazing change of attitude. So we're always to remember that it's him, that it's Christ who is the light. And we hope we can reflect a little of his light. But we surely need to be humble about it. God himself is humble. Have you ever thought about that? The Trinity, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he's a humble God. The Holy Spirit never calls attention to himself. He always glorifies Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, was born in a stable, died on a cross. That's humility. And when he healed someone, like in Matthew 15, 31, said he healed the deaf, the crippled, the blind, and so forth. And the people praised the God of Israel. It was in such a manner that it, it wasn't calling attention to himself. Although he was the son of God, they were praising the God, the Father in heaven. And also he said to Philip later, Philip, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Was Jesus humble? The most humble of all men. And therefore, if we've seen Jesus who is humble, we've seen the Father, then the Father is likewise humble. When I was a new Christian, I didn't tell anyone about this, but I thought that God must have a big ego always wanting people to praise him and bow down to him. And as the years passed, I learned that God doesn't have any ego at all because God is love. Now, love is not just a characteristic of God. It's his very essence. It's his nature. That describes God. 
Everything flows out of His love. And love is always outward. It's never inward. I'm the one God showed me as time went by that had a problem with pride and still has a problem with pride at times. And the only time I'm completely safe from that pride and not thinking about myself and what other people are thinking about me and how I came across in that conversation and, and focused on my purposes, my goals, my wants, my desires, my pains, my fears, me, 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 me. The only time I can escape that is when I'm praising and thanking God and focusing on Him or when I'm serving someone in love. That gets us out of this terrible, terrible trap that we find ourselves in the human condition of focusing on self. Pride caused the grandest of all the angels, apparently, Lucifer, to fall from heaven and become Satan. He wanted God's glory. Pride caused Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve to fall in the garden. They wanted to be like God. And it's universal, all of us. Our basic problem in life is pride and rebellion. A few weeks ago, Pastor Kirk had, had a cross up here, or a couple of crosses. And he passed out these little forms, and the congregation was to check off the struggles that, that we have with depression or fear or, or, or whatever. And to bring them up and, and put them in a little box in front of the cross. And about 800 people filled out those cards. And 44% of, of those confessed to a problem with pride. So a lot of people around here are having a struggle with pride. Not only that 44%, but the other 56% either don't realize they have pride or they're too proud to admit it, <laughs> right? <laughs> pride is like people that eat garlic. I have some dear friends, they're, they're, they're health fanatics, truly, nutrition fanatics, and they must eat about a half a pound of garlic a day. When they come in the room, they knock everybody over, and they're totally oblivious. That's a picture of people with pride. It stinks, <laughs> but they don't smell it. <laughs> We're born with a desire to be significant. The two things that little kids say when they're learning to talk, the first thing they say is, let me do it, let me do it. And the second thing they say when they do it, is look at me, look at me. That's not a sin. That's, I believe that's a God-given something inside us. God wants us to be significant. We are significant to Him. And we're to glory in our significance to Him. But we get it twisted and want to get glory from men. And it becomes pride. And it stinks. I confess that as I grew up into manhood, I had a lot of pride. I couldn't help it. I was so doggone good looking. <laughs> I know that's probably hard for you to believe today because time changes things. But I used to look like Brad Pitt. <laughs> now I look like a gravel pit. <laughs> The Bible says that the years eat up our beauty like moths eat up wool. And the moth's been working on me a long time. <laughs> Sometimes when I glance at myself in the mirror, I laugh out loud. I think that's ridiculous. Sometimes I cry. <laughs> and I don't want to scare you, but if you live long enough, this is the way you're going to look, more or less. <laughs> You better run for the Botox. <laughs> or maybe you ought to stop taking pride in how good looking you are, or how rich, or how smart, or how famous, or how good, because those things are going to pass away. 
Pride makes, makes you an enemy of God. And who's going to win that battle? 1 Peter 5, 5 says, God opposes the proud. He actively works against the proud. And he gives grace to the humble. And the next verse says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. God wants to exalt us, but at the proper time and for the proper reasons. Notice it says, humble yourselves. It's an inside job. This is your work, my work. God is not going to do it for us. Now, if you're proud, he's going to bring you down. He will. He, he, he may humiliate you. He'll bring something in your life. It's happened to me to absolutely humiliate you for your own good. But we can react to that humiliation in resentment and hardness, or we can humble ourselves. It's always a personal choice. Pride is the reason, I believe, that it's so hard for many people to accept Christ, because it takes faith. Jesus said, you have to become like a little child. And faith seems so unmanly to many people. It seems so anti-intellectual, so squishy. Besides that, what's my family going to think? What are my friends going to think? That's called the fear of man. And it's rooted in pride. Maybe someone here needs to hear this. If you don't humble yourself, you're going to live and die without God. There's nothing humorous about that. The way we come to God, the only God there is, the living God, the God revealed in, in history, in a nation of Israel, in a people, in prophets, in this book, and supremely in Jesus Christ, is by Humble faith. That's the way we come to God. You better decide, my friend. One day that door will close. Pride is also the reason it's so hard for, for people to forgive others. Yes, I've ministered to people. They've been horribly abused, traumatized, wounded. But God wants us to forgive for our sake, so that we can be set free. But some people refuse, no, because of pride. Pride is an ongoing, lifetime struggle. It's not as if when we become Christ, it's dealt with. That's the start of dealing with it, just the beginning. The Jewish rabbis used to have a saying, a question would be asked, when does man overcome all of his pride? And the answer was, 15 minutes after he dies. I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. It's something we struggle with all our lives. In chapter 6 of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus warns about how we can let pride infiltrate our religion. We can practice our righteousness before men to be noticed by them. He talks about fasting and praying and giving so that we get glory and recognition from men instead of from God. In Matthew 6, 2, he says, So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and streets to be honored by men. Can you believe that the Pharisees actually had a guy following around with a trumpet and they blew it when they were going to give so people would notice it. It's terrible. Oh, that reminds me. I, I forgot to put my tithe in the offering plate this morning. W would an usher please come forward? forget this sermon, but you won't forget that. 
<laughs> of course, we would, we, we would never act that way, would we? A couple of weeks ago, four of us, four of us guys, drove out to the Dream Center in Hollywood. It's a big ministry center, and worked for a week with Clayton Gallagher and Hope for Homeless Youth, work, work with his kids. And since I'm an early riser, one morning I got up about 5.30 or before 6 and walked three or four blocks to the Starbucks on Sunset Boulevard. Uh, Sunset Boulevard used to be a very glamorous place, but boy, it's shabby now. Uh, poverty and drug addiction and homeless people. And so I got me a grande and a cup of oatmeal. That, that's a new menu item. I, I get a a little remittance for mentioning that. <laughs> and um, I was sitting at uh, the uh, table and uh, I smelled something bad. True story. And I looked up and a, a homeless guy was shuffling past me. He had a beard down to here. His clothes were absolutely filthy. The, the, the smell of, of stale sweat and goodness knows what else. He smelled like a goat. Actually, that's insulting to goats. <laughs> and he was so repulsive as he walked by that I, I literally shuddered. I went, ooh. <laughs> he went to the back of the store and stood around, and pretty soon I felt guilty because of my attitude, so I went over and got him a grande and a cup of oatmeal. And as I walked across the store and handed it to him, a thought came into my mind. I hope the waitress is watching. Ooh, <laughs> God have mercy. So I thought I would come back and start a Pharisees club. <laughs> you can sign up at the small groups desk <laughs> if you qualify. <laughs> See, it's a lifetime struggle. You know, we, we, we get to thinking, well, you know, I've, I, I don't have any trouble with that anymore. And it pops up again. I, I want to say just a little bit about the Last Supper. It, I think it's the best example in, in Scripture, or one of the best examples of, of humility. Remember, the, G, the, the disciples had just had a big argument about which of them was the greatest. And then... Um, in John chapter 13, six through 12, uh, well, first it says that, uh, that Jesus came out and, and started with a towel and with a pan of water and, and started washing the disciples feet, and, and Peter wouldn't let him. Uh, the Lord came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And Jesus answered and said, what I'm doing you don't understand now, but you'll know after this. And Peter said, you'll never wash me. You know, I think I started the wrong place. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. And we know that Peter resisted that and that he, the words he said, and so Peter acceded to his, his washing his feet. Have you ever been in a church where, where they had foot washings? <laughs> When I was a pastor a number of years ago, we were having a prayer meeting or some meeting in an evening, 12 or 15 people were there, and one of the ladies said, you know, I believe the Lord is telling me we're supposed to wash one another's feet tonight. And I said, what? And so a few other people said, yeah, that would be a good thing for us to do. So we, we all did that. We, we went around the circle and we washed one another's feet and prayed for one another. And I didn't have any, any problem washing other people's feet, but it, was, it wasn't easy to let them wash my feet. I was very uncomfortable when they did that. 
So I know how 